uh, Marzana, it's very good to see you. Thank you very much for joining us um, today. Um, so we're going to talk a, bit, a little bit about your the research you've been done. You've sent me uh, the preprint of your paper titled Large Language Models Effectively Leverage Document-Level Context for Literary Translation, But Critical Errors Persist. And as you know, and as, as some of our listeners know, um, I've been interested in um, how, to what extent um, GPT-4 or other large language, language models can deal with uh, literary translation. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit a little bit later about why literary translation is a particularly interesting issue. But maybe first, can you tell us a little bit about your background and why you got interested in this topic? Sure, thank you for having me here today. Um, so basically I have background in linguistics. I've been a translator myself for uh, about 10 years between, and I was translating between Polish, Japanese and English. Um, and currently I'm a post-doctoral researcher and I'm doing research in natural language processing. Uh, basically, um, I'm interested in machine translation and also in evaluation of machine translation. Okay, so so why did you choose to investigate um, the use of GPT? You used GPT 3.5 mainly in your study, but why did you choose to focus on literary translation? Um, Mainly, so basically, um, first, the reason why we even look at uh, those large language models like GPT-4 or, or GPT-3 um, is that it, it, it was not very obvious, uh, even like a couple of months ago, that a model like that, that is not trained on data, which are parallel data. So, for example, I have French uh, data uh, translated to English, and the model will see both and will kind of learn. Um, and it, those models are not explicitly trained on this data. Uh, and it's not very obvious that the model will even be able to translate. So this is translate, kind translate of anything, new. not only literary, but no. translate, yes, translate anything. Um, and of course, literary text is even more challenging. So in machine translation so far, uh, for a very long time, uh, the community was uh, more focus on news translations or on or technical texts. Uh, that's partially also because of the uh, available corpora. So we had parallel corpora that were, for example, from Europol, uh, so uh, proceedings and, and such. And um, there is not a lot of parallel, uh, literally, uh, text data. So even if we wanted to train such a model, that wouldn't be so easy. And also a literal text, as you no, um, has a lot of different challenges that uh, maybe straightforward news texts do not. So a translator will add text, omit text, they will manipulate text, rearrange it um, to make it more um, enjoyable for the, for the target audience. Right, and also literary texts themselves. So the translation process is different when humans do the translation. And also the, the nature of literary texts is different. There's yeah. Often, uh, one, one example is that there's a, often they have a mixture of conversation of dialogue and, and sort of straight text. And dialogue pre can present some very um, unique uh, challenges for a translator in the sense that it, it can show the social class, uh, the age of the, of the speaker, all sorts of things, the relationships between the, between the people having a conversation. Also, there's um, often an artistic element to literary translation as Definitely. well, too, in that the uh, language itself uses metaphor and similes and other other rhetorical techniques to to express images and and all sorts of all sorts of things. And also, one thing from the reader's point of view um, is that readers, in general, want to get immersed in the text when they're reading it. And so they, they you know you read the story and you get immersed in the story. And so um, if a translation seems to be awkward, or if it has too much explanation, or if it, it reads like a like a like a manual rather than a novel, then that is possibly is not as good as well too. And so that those have all created big big challenges for conventional machine translation. So so it's very interesting that that these large language models are able to do it at first, but then how do they compare with the traditional machine translation? So t tell us about the study that you did and how you conducted it to look at the actual um, translation using a GPT 3.5. Uh, so we basically uh, were looking at two things. So one is that uh, the traditional translation pipeline was uh, very much focused on sentence level. 
And that's because, uh, well, primary, maybe 10, 20 years ago, we didn't have systems that would leverage uh, longer contexts, mm. uh, but also because of the availability of those parallel corpora that were on the sentence level. And um, so the, one of the questions we are asking is whether um, a model like that, which has much longer context, um, would be able to leverage that context to actually output this translation. This is not... I know that people are using GPT-4 like that, but this is not an obvious question. And this is, it's very possible that the model will just omit a lot in the middle, for example, uh, and not translate everything. So one of the questions was whether it's even possible to leverage this context in a kind of satisfactory way. Um, another was, uh, how does that compare to some of the shelf available tools like Google Translate in our case, which are trained on those parallel data, um, probably on the sentence level, they do translate on the sentence level. And while I don't have any proofs of that, I'm pretty sure a lot of this training data in Google Translate is, is kind of like a news text, informative text, which is different, yeah. right? So um, the translation is safer in a way. Um, okay, so how, how, did you do, how did you actually do this study that, that you've written a paper about? How, how, who were your, what data did you use? How did you collect your data? Things like that. Uh, so basically one problem with those large language models is that uh, the data that we use for translation may already be in the training data. So uh -huh. um, if we take any available data set that is uh, available right now uh, for uh, machine translation, it's very possible um, that it's already in the training data. So what we did, we basically took translations that were published um in 2021 2022 um that are not easily available online so for into japanese um we really had to look for them or either buy them and sometimes in some cases ocr texts and then uh kind of get a um, digital version um uh, so things like that right so which which languages did you look at so uh, we looked at uh, translation into Japanese, Polish, and English, because those okay. are the languages I'm very familiar with. And as for the source languages, uh, we also choose languages that uh, were diverse, but also some that I had some familiarity with, which was uh, besides Polish, Japanese, and English, uh, Russian, Czech, uh, German, uh, French, um, I think that's about it. Okay, and you had so you had the text translated from these various languages into uh, Japanese and English and Polish by by both GPT three point five and Google Translate. Yes, and we also have the human translation. Okay. And you may ask why we even needed the human translation. Would it be safer to just take texts that were never translated? That's kind of tells us right away it wasn't seen by the model. And that is correct. Um, that would be maybe a safer way of doing that. However, we always wanted to also test available uh, automatic metrics to measure um, the quality of the translation. And for that, we need a reference text very often. Okay, and what with these were from no excerpts from novels. Is that correct? The, yes, those are from novels. Okay, and, they, and how, how long was the typical text that you um, analyzed? Uh, so it's uh, beyond one paragraph, typically. Um, oh. uh, and of course, how do you define paragraph in, uh, in case of dialogue, for example? That's, uh, uh, that's a very hard question. But uh, what we try to do is to take text that is uh, kind of self-contained. So a human translator looking at the text would be able to translate it. Uh, and we aligned it manually. So uh, to be 100% uh, sure that the actual source text aligns with the human translation. Um, yes, I think that's about okay. it. And so then how did you how did you evaluate the differences between these these three translations, the Google Translate translation, the GPT version, and the human version? So um, in the natural language processing uh, community, there is a lot of automatic metrics where you can evaluate text. However, as you know, in machine translation, in, uh, I'm sorry, in literary translation, those automatic metrics, which very often rely on a human reference, are not necessarily reliable because there is an infinite number of human references that will be equally valid. Uh, there is a there is many different ways to translate text, so. 
um, evaluating it in this only in this way, it, it's pretty difficult. We hired uh, translators uh, who are native speakers of the target language. And that was also very important because um, the, as you probably know, the text generated by such models sometimes is, is uh, natural, but not necessarily something you see every day. So if you are not a native speaker, it's extremely hard to judge whether something is natural or not. Um, so we hired those translators uh, who had some experience. They were not necessarily literary translators. That would be much harder to do. We had 18 different pairs, so hiring 18 people who are also uh, experts uh, in literary translation was, was sadly not possible. Okay, so, the, so there was a subjective element in the evaluation, but a, a, a literature in itself and literary translation has a subjective element in, inevitably. I guess of course, right. of course, okay. yes. That's a good point. And so what, what were the results, if you would like to summarize the results? So uh, in terms of uh, comparing with uh, Google Translate, the results were over overwhelmingly in favor of uh, GPT 3.5 in this case. Um, in terms of uh, whether the model can leverage the context, uh, we also found cases, uh, very clear cases, where the model can actually leverage the context mm -hmm. and kind of connect the sentences together, which, of course, the sentence level model, if we just translate sentence by sentence, is just not able to do without yeah. getting this context. Oh, were there any differences among the language pairs? Did it do did one of the models or the human trans, or not the human trans, or did one of the, the two engines do better with certain language directions than others? Or what did you find in that? Regard? Yeah, so, um, uh, I mean, it probably is obvious that uh, since the model itself is uh, trained mostly on, on English data, um, translations into English were better. Um, for example, German English was better than French English. Um, so that's one of the observations. But in general, uh, overall, uh, anything that was translated into English was uh, was better than into Japanese or into Polish. Mm -hmm. uh, translation into Japanese, I think, had the most omissions. So there were omissions. Mm -hmm. And some omissions are, are good. Some omissions are actually maybe even um better for for the flow uh, however we don't want to omit anything uh, important so we asked our translators to to report whether there were omissions or not but only in, if those omissions were important for the plot so if there was something omitted that could be omitted by even by a translator they they didn't really report that um as for translation into polish there was quite a few grammatical mistakes so polish is a highly inflected language, there are cases, uh, there are different verb forms, there are different verb prefixes, and all that uh, was not necessarily There were more of those mistakes in the GPT translation. What about the Google Translate? Was Google Translate? Oh, no, there's oh, definitely more of those mistakes in Google Translation. So um, uh, translating out of, even, even if you compare, which we didn't compare, but um, even looking at our comparison where we compare like the sentence level versus like paragraph level mm -hmm. translation so without context and with context and then we compare this with context with google mm -hmm. uh, even if you look at those two comparisons it's very easy to realize that uh, probably if you compare the sentence level translations of gpt uh, 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 model versus the uh, google translate uh, still um, in this case the model the gpt model would win Okay. In your paper, using a term, I, 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 a concept I knew, but I didn't know the term for it, which was pivot language. So, in the mm -hmm. case of machine, can you explain briefly what a pivot language in the context means in the context of machine translation? So, if we have a data set, for example, if I want to train a system that translates between Czech and Polish, I would need a data set with data parallel data from Czech to Polish. If I don't have that. Uh, then I can uh, use two different data sets. For example, I can have a data set Czech to English, and then I also have Polish to English. I can train a Czech uh, English system and Polish English system, and then I can translate um, the text from Czech into English, and then use my other system to translate from English into Polish. The problem is that sometimes this results in some information loss. Yeah. Um, in case of Czech and, and uh, Polish, uh, this would be, for example, a gender of the speaker. If it's in the past tense, both of those languages encode the gender, uh, while English does not. 
So once we translate into English, this information is lost. And when once we want to translate it back into Polish, uh, we don't have this information. So it's basically a 50-50 chance of getting it right. Right. For for our listeners who aren't aren't familiar with translation, you can kind of view this use of a pivot language like a children's game where it's called a telegram game, I think something like this, where one person whispers something in the ear of another person, that person whispers the same message to the next person. And you, if you go down the chain, then you confirm what the what the input message was and then the output message was, and it, you could get something completely different. Um, and so the same thing happens with, with translation as well, too. There's always some information loss, some information change. And so in the case of conventional machine translation systems that that when they have to go through pair to between pairs of languages that do not have a large corpus of direct translations to be based on, they have to use a pivot language, typically English. Um, and so, what about GPT? Is it do you know? Do we know anything about how it's doing translation? Is it using when it translates between two relatively minor languages? Uh, I don't want to. That's a <laughs> term. So two relatively unattested languages. Do we know, is it pivoting through English? Does it have some kind of abstract interlanguage or do is it a black box? It's basically predicting the next word. So uh, we don't really know exactly what is happening. Like nobody knows exactly what is happening in those many layers because okay. you can imagine um, you have a text, you encode this text so that computer understands it. And then it goes through many different layers and then you predict and there is a prediction for the next word so literally once you put something into this gpt4 interface what it does is just predicting the next word based on the words before um so we don't know exactly how this works um there is the con concept of maybe transfer learning maybe there is some uh, understanding of another language that the model gets from other language that it was trained on. Uh, but of course, it has to be trained on all those languages to be able to generate text. So in case of uh, GPT-4, we don't know exactly what the training data is, but we know that uh, for the previous model, um, the percentage was around 93% percent or seven I don't remember right now for English and then the remaining very small percentage was for all the other languages and there's many different so for Czech would be like 0 0.006 or something so it's a very small percentage of data so we can uh, we can kind of um, speculate that it may be taking this information from Czech like maybe it's somehow Taking some information from what it learned, what it learned about Polish, for instance, uh, we don't know that. Okay, so you uh, you mentioned so your study because you I think you did it in March of, of this year of twenty twenty three, um, and so you you used Chat uh, GPT three point five, and then in the middle of March, um, OpenAI released the successors with GPT um, uh, four. And so you in your in your preprint of your paper, you do mention that briefly. Have you done any more testing of comparing the previous version of OpenAI software with the more advanced version um, in terms of uh, this particular issue of literary translation? Yes, we are doing it um, right now, actually, also. Uh, however, one thing to mention is that GPT 3.5 is a family of models. So okay. what the user gets uh, through the interface, what is called GPT 3.5, is not what we used. Oh. Um, we, I do not know for sure, but that one uh, is called Turbo in the API. So if you want to access it uh, through um, Python, for example, a programming language. And I think that version may be a little bit, it, it's specified for like dialogue. What we oh. used was DaVinci 003. So it's a little bit different version. It may act actually a little bit differently. Right now we are doing testing on GPT-4. And I see the same errors uh, uh, emerging in those difficult paragraphs, even in uh, paragraphs which uh, I would suspect that the model might have seen those translations. So there is one translation from uh, Sayaka Murata uh, from uh, Convenience Star Woman, Convenien, which I think this one actually was somewhere in the training data because the model or at least model is able to give me the name of the translator so i don't know maybe it was just some news article about it i have not i don't have proofs whether it was there or not but it 
it is possible. It's still making lots of mistakes on that one. Mm -hmm. And that's because, in, in, as you know, in Japanese, um, and there is a uh, subject is submitted very often. Um, sometimes it changes within the sentence and really you just need it to know it from the context or you refer to your speaker in a third person or to yourself in a third person. This is very difficult to, to track. Right. I was looking ahead. So, so GPT-4 was released in mid-March. Within the last week, Google has released their What's it called? Palm two or Bart. Yeah, yeah. Bart. Oh, Palm two is the model, the underlying model. Yes. Right, right. And um, and there are the whole space is moving is moving very very quickly. In the in the midterm, in the short term, in the midterm, what are your research plans in this field? What are, what are you planning to be looking at next? Are you continuing to focus on machine translation, or do you have other topics that you're interested in? So currently, we will continue to look at machine translation at, uh, from a couple of different perspectives. So we, uh, here at UMass Amherst, uh, we are developing a website uh, in our lab, which will be featuring machine translated text. So we are working for this uh, on this text so that it's as friendly for the reader as possible. We don't want people to read um, terribly translated text, mm -hmm. um, but we also hope that we will be able to um, uh, gather some uh, comments from the users on the specific fragments of the text that may need some uh, refinement mm -hmm. and maybe use that to further improve the translation. Mm -hmm. um, we are also looking at developing uh, some metrics that could measure the translation quality because okay. uh, of course human translation is ideal but it has to be executed in a proper way. This is not necessarily easy. It takes time. Our evaluation took about two months to execute. Mm -hmm. Uh, to find the translators, to talk with them, to actually make sure that they are translators, not some random people. Um, it's it's not that easy um, to make sure that they know both languages, that they are native speakers of the target language, then that they understand the task. Then for me to, to kind of check those evaluations, uh, categorize some errors that into like smaller categories, et cetera, that was very time consuming. A normal uh, NLP researcher, doesn't does not necessarily have time to do that, especially at the development mm -hmm. stage where you want to compare a couple of different approaches and models right away and you want to move forward. Mm -hmm. So for that, we, we need some automatic metrics that will be able to uh, measure that on um, a level beyond a sentence. Yeah, that's, that's really exciting. Looking ahead and being, being more speculative about this, what do you see as the potential for large language models or similar sorts of, 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 of systems for translating literature, in, and, and let's define literature in a broad sense, so not only novels or, or short stories, but mm -hmm. it, could be, it could be manga, it could be movie dialogue, it could be plays. So in other words, text that has a narrative element and an artistic element and an entertainment element. Um, and and do, you, do you foresee these models being able to translate with little or no human supervision um, well enough to be, to be entertaining, to be enjoyable, to be inspiring, the way people are inspiring by literature? Or, or, or would, will there always have to be a human element either as an editor or will there always have to be a human translator? What, 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 what are your, your thoughts about this? I know this is speculation, but... Yeah, I, I think I still see the uh, literary translation of the last bastion of, of translation. And I do believe we need uh, human input. Um, there is a lot of ethical also implication of just taking the work and translating it uh, by machine. We never know what's inside. And I would never risk uh, just releasing this and, and claiming this is a good translation and maybe uh, putting it on the market. Um, what we are doing here with the website that would be collecting judgments is a little bit different because we are disclaiming that this is machine translation that, uh, and we are doing it to collect actually uh, some feedback on that. Uh, however, uh, I don't think that we will be able to, to see uh, purely machine translated novels, which are perfect anytime soon, if at all. Uh, I think it's much more beneficial for the community to work with uh, with translators mm -hmm. uh, to kind of develop tools that will be helpful for them to, in this translation task. Okay, well, I, not not to disagree with you, but I can see that as a researcher, you are you are very careful and conscious of these these ethical issues 
around translation. I, I, I hate to say it, but I think the, the market in some sense is not so concerned about, about, about these ethical issues. So I know that I've heard already now, but for example, um, fans of Japanese manga are using machine translation for fan translations of, of manga. So there, there are these people who want to read these Japanese manga that are written in Japanese. And so they, that has, there's been a lot of um, legal or semi-legal or illegal um, translation, fan <laughs> translation of Japanese manga. It's a, it's a copyright issue, it's an eth ethical issue, but the people want to read it. And so they've been, there have been a lot of human translators, amateur translators doing that. And now people are using machines for do that. And I think that's driven by the reader. I think there will be publisher driven machine translation appearing pretty soon if it's not already in that because there's so much material that isn't translated and people will, and it's so much cheaper to do it with machines than with humans that I wouldn't be surprised if we start seeing machine translation of novels and, and stories and other things like that very, very soon. The same way, for example, in the case of uh, audiobooks, narrated audiobooks. So I think even now a, a good human narrator is better than a than the, what are now quite good um, you know, text to voice synthesis systems. But already Apple and other companies are marketing audiobooks that have been read by by AI narrators. And so I personally think, even though I so I agree, as a researcher, you want to be very careful. You need to be very careful about the ethical issues. As within many issues in the case of this AI, um, I think it's going to move ahead of the restraints that people might want to put on them for various good reasons. So, oh yes, but that's why I believe it's so important to evaluate how this actually works because we don't really know uh, and we don't have proper evaluation. And what, for example, OpenAI did, they just released a couple, a performance on a couple of different benchmarks, which are just data sets that are very artificial and made to just evaluate the uh, model's performance, but uh, we don't really know exactly what the model is capable of or not. And you mentioned manga translation. Uh, so actually, I know that a lot of people is talking about OpenAI and GPT-4 and maybe about Palm 2, but there has been lots and lots of models released in the last two, three weeks um, by the community. And those are open source models that are encouraging other people to release even more. And some of those models uh, currently can handle prompts that are visual. So uh, if you multi, can imagine- Multimodal multi in other words, right? Uh, yes, but if you can imagine, uh, that you can give the model a couple of examples of mangas, like a screenshot of a page and a translation, uh -huh. and then uh, just prompt it. So ask it for for to translate uh, another page. That is becoming very real very soon. Yes, yes. So things are moving very, very quickly. Um, and so I'm very, very grateful to this opportunity to talk with you and to hear about your your research and to share it with our with our viewers. I will put a link in the in the YouTube description to your webpage where the the paper that we're discussing today, that we discussed today, is linked, and then other people can follow your research and the re and the research of your research team. So, th so thank you very much again, Marzana. It was very good to talk with you. Thank you for having me. Okay. <laughs>